How does one write from an honest place? Best-selling novelist Terry McMillan knows better than most. She'll discuss it next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. What does it mean to be one of the most important novelists in the world? Best selling author Terry McMillan knows the story. She is the story. Welcome to the show, Terry. Thank you. Tell us about your initial thoughts regarding writing. When were you first inspired to write? Oh, yeah, I was in junior college in Los Angeles. And, um, some guy that I thought I was in love with broke my heart and I wrote a poem about it. And it was not a, well, no, I take that back. It's probably the best poem I've ever written. I am not a poet. <laughs> but um, from there I started um, I, I wrote a lot of poetry, bad poetry. And then I went to UC Berkeley and I ended up writing scathing editorials for our campus newspaper. We had two. One was Black Thoughts and the other one was and still is the Daily Californian. And so they still just let me blast off. And um, and I, I apparently I was had opinions. Um, and that's sort of how I started. And then I learned as a result of being in journal I ended up majoring in journalism just because um, and I didn't like it but I loved writing. And um, I used to actually make up a lot of things when I had to write a review of something um, for my journalism class, I would just lie. And then I found out lying was more believable. So that's how I started, <laughs> seriously. Who were some of the writers who inspired you at the time? Um, back then I would say Ring Lardner, um, you know, I used to, you know, Joan Didion, people like that in terms of journalism, Truman Capote, all of them, because we were in the whole new journalism mode, um, which helped me. But then I ended up taking a fiction writing class with Ishmael Reed, and I learned a lot about voice, which he told me that I had one. And I was like, really? Because um, back in the day, and it still happens, and people were like, oh, well, hello, sir. I thought that was what he meant. Then I learned what it meant, you know, that it was the way that I wrote. Um, but Catherine Ann Porter, I love short stories. Um, John Gardner, um, I, you know, I love Toni Morrison. Ring Lardner was one of my favorite writers. Um, J.D. Salinger, you know, people who had really strong voices, I just sort of gravitated towards. Um, and um, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, a lot of writers that from that period. Is a lot of writing autobiographical? Is your writing autobiographical? Is my writing autobiographical? <clears throat> you know, no and yes. I think all writing is autobiographical, even if because you're bringing your sensibility to it. Because what a writer chooses to write about says a lot about them as far as I'm concerned, and that's what makes it autobiographical. So if I write about a grandmother who is raised, is raising her grandsons because her daughter is a crackhead, and you know, um, it's because I, I've never been a grandmother, I don't have obviously grandkids, but it's, it feels familiar to me, and I wanna know what it feels like to be in that position. Um, so, you know, just say uh, Stella, I went to Jamaica, yes. I met a younger man, yes. Um, and I get home and I ended up writing a poem because I was thinking, oh, Terry, you broke the law. And I didn't. But what my dilemma was, was there's a double standard. Why is it, why, what am I, I'm not doing anything wrong. What, what's the problem with me liking somebody who's much younger when men do it all the time? So that was my issue. That's to me what made it uh, very personal. And I was, I was angry about that. 
you know, that people would make such a big deal about me going out with a younger guy, even though he was too young. But I didn't care at the time. Um, but no, I, I um, even waiting to exhale and all those books. Uh, but, uh, but the thing about Stella, I have to say this, people think it's autobiographical. The only thing is, was, is what I just said to you, because I wrote that book in 31 days, and Jonathan had never even stepped foot in this country. And he, it was his, through his encouragement that I actually wrote the story, because I told him, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. This is really silly. And, um, and, I, and I told him, I said, you know, I can't tell this, but I, was, I couldn't stop writing about it. Because I really was, it wasn't even angry. I was questioning. And, and that's what we do as writers. You sort of question people's behavior. And so in this case, I was questioning in some sense my own, but I put it in a situation, because none of that stuff was true, <laughs> except that I met a younger man. And where I met him was in Jamaica. But all that other stuff, it, couldn't, it, it didn't happen. And I think they were getting married by the time Jonathan hadn't even gotten off the plane. Mm. It was a fantasy. Your reference to the time frame made me think of another question. You're known as a fast writer. What's the difference between a fast writer and a slow writer? I don't exactly know. When I say fast writer, you know, one of the things, I mean, I've taught for years, one of the things that I try to teach my students to do is to write without thinking. And when you do that, you, you and, and when you don't, you're like constipated. You are to, you're so busy editing yourself and so busy trying to make every sentence perfect that you lose sight of what it is that you're even writing about, your feeling. It's not the, I call it literary masturbation, really. And so many writers, it's like every, and that's one reason why I have, you know, some critics don't refer to my work as literary, which I really don't care. Um, but it's the power of what it is that you're saying that's more important. And sometimes, if you write from your gut and your heart, as opposed to your brain, you'll be, you'll let it rip. And to me, there's honesty in that. You're not looking over your own shoulder. You, you can come back and do that, you know? So to me, you, you write from your heart and your, and your gut, and then you go back and do what I'm doing now, which is called revising. Um, and then, and that's when the brain comes into it. But some people are just super perfectionists. And so every sentence has to say what they wanted to say the first time. And you know, when I, when I hear that it takes somebody 10 years or to, five years to write a book, I'm thinking, you know, I could have had a V8. <laughs> <laughs> how, how disciplined are you as a writer? Do you get up and write every day? I write every day. I'm good for about five hours. I usually take a nap after about three, and, um, and then I'll come back and I'll do it again. Sometimes I go to the gym, not as often as I should, but um, no, and I do it every day. And you know, I have family members who don't, they get it now, but I don't really care if they do, because this is what I do. And once I'm in the story and I'm invested in my characters, their lives, almost become, I don't want to say more important than mine, but I'm curious about what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're going to get through this. And I get strength from that. Do you regard writing as work? And after you've uh, written Who's, Who says writing is work? I, I'm asking. Do, do you think of it as work, or is it? What do you mean by Pleasure. work? Work as in hard, as in difficult, that you have oh, to reward yourself once you're finished doing a, a period of writing. No. I, I refer to it as my work, mm -hmm. but I don't mean it literally. Right. Um, no, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love it. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but it's not even about me. That's the thing. I'm not doing this um, for the attention. I never knew anybody was even going to like what I wrote. I didn't know I was going to so much, quote unquote, like what I wrote, but I didn't know the impact that my work was going to have on others. At first, it had to have an impact on me, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, all of it. Um, but I write about 
people going through things that bother me, that I, that, you know, I want to know where people get their strength from, their courage from, to get through a lot of BS. And sometimes people are victims. Sometimes we victimize ourselves. And I just, I'm interested in how we get through stuff. And that, to me, is, I get strength from it. And, and plus, what is the, what else would, why else would you do it? You know, you can watch TV just for pure entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. So I don't, I don't see it as work. And, and I'm compelled to do it. I don't just sit around and think, gee, what story can I write next? Mm -hmm. And what will people really like? And, you know, I need a check. Mm -hmm. No, it's not, no. Um, no, it's exciting to me to, and also to me, writing is not selfish. It's a way to jump out of my own skin into someone else's. And so to me, it requires a certain, it helps me become more empathetic and sympathetic sometimes. You went, you went to Jamaica and found inspiration for a book. Have you had that experience in other countries? And do you like to travel internationally? Oh, I love to travel. Yeah. I'm going, I'm fin almost finished with a book, revising. And I'm, I'm going to Cabo in May or June. Um, I always go to Cabo because I live in Southern California. Mm. And it's easy, but it's, um, but no, I spent a month in Paris. I wrote my last book. Um, the first 50, 60 pages in Paris. I like to travel. I, when I, I was just in Jamaica last October, um, and I went for a month, but I didn't last because it was too hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I haven't been into any other countries where I actually go and write. Mm -hmm. um, but Paris, Paris and London, I, I love. Well, a lot of people I, seem to be inspired to write when they're in France, and oh, so I, I've heard that so many oh, times. And I ate in he the restaurant where Hemingway used to write. I love Paris, you know, and in my next life I might live there. <laughs> <laughs> but I went to Aspen, Colorado for a month through the Aspen Writers Institute, which was great. They gave me this house. I had a little beer out front and everything. Um, and I, I was there for 17 days, that's all I had. But I wrote um, 90 pages. I don't know, I wrote 90 pages, but I was, it was unbelievable. Whenever you can step outside of your world, everybody can't do it. And what I'm doing now, um, I, I know how to block out the real world, I'll put it that way. Coffee helps. <laughs> Tell us about the importance of reading today. Oh. So many people seem to have moved away from reading or, or they're reading in different formats. Does it matter what the format is? You've sold millions of books and I love books and I can't imagine not having access to a book because I, I like the feel of it. I like to read it. You, you know, I have one of these stupid Kindles I try to take it with me. I, I can't even remember the last time. I, I don't like reading on Kindles. I don't like any handheld devices where you have to read. I know the advantage of them, and I know it's there. But there's nothing better than that tactile experience of opening a book and flipping, turning the page. Ah! <laughs> um, I don't know. I try to encourage people to read. I mean, that's what I give kids for presents. Babies, it included everybody gets books. But, you know, just like in school, I don't know. I just found out yesterday that kids, not only are they not learning cursive, they don't even have penmanship classes anymore, I don't think. Um, and if, if there are shortcuts to everything, you know, you don't, their attention spans are so short based on all this media and technology and all these different devices that, because it takes a certain amount of patience to read. 
And I think that a lot of kids, their attention span, they're losing it, you know, because they can just turn it off mm -hmm. when they get bored and um, or jump to something else. You don't read that way. So I think there's a danger in it. And except for parents who are very conscientious and read to their children when they're younger so that they instill something and also put time limits on these stupid devices. Um, but I think also that, you know, a lot of people use some of these devices because it's just pure laziness. And it's a way to just shut them up and even to sum up for some of us as adults to turn off our brains. But a lot of it to me is a waste of time. And I mean, I love Twitter, Facebook, eh. But, you know, there's nothing better. And I have a chair, a nice recliner, just for reading. And that's when I sit in that chair. I don't need any television. I don't even need any music. I don't need anything because I want to get lost, and that's what I do. If you were in charge of education nationally, what would you change in the early years in terms of reading and writing? What would you add back into the curriculum? I would have the children read out loud in class. Um, I would have them write about themselves, regardless, and not worry about their grammar initially, initially. Um, but I think that they should be taught grammar. They should be taught how to write as, a, as young people, but not before they learn how to express themselves. They can do it simultaneously. There's a sneaky way to do it, and a good teacher knows that. Um, but because a lot of kids are turned off from writing because if they don't learn how to speak proper English at home, it affects the way that they express themselves on paper. And Sometimes if you can express yourself on paper, you can at least be somewhat articulate. And I, I, I think reading and writing can save you. And if you learn it as a child, and if you learn how to read things that you enjoy, and that's where a lot of these schools fall short. You know, the kids don't enjoy a lot of what they read. And then when they write, they're only writing, the, what they're writing is just being criticized. And they need to experience some level of freedom to be able to express themselves. And I think what's going on at home to some extent, what's in their heart, if they've been molested, say for instance, you know, has, has anything terrible ever happened to you? You know, they should be able to write it down. Um, what you love, what you don't like, who gets on your nerves, you know, and I've done this with young people, and it's, it's really cathartic for them, and the writing is so much better because they aren't censoring themselves. Then you go back and criticize them and say, well, let's talk about some verbs and prepositions and adverbs and adjectives, and, you know, because my son was in sixth grade, he went to a really good middle school. But he wrote this paper, it was really, he was always in, into the environment. And I said, Solomon, you know what? I don't think this sentence has a verb. <laughs> and he said, I don't need a verb. My teacher told me I didn't need a verb. And I said, I don't care if your teacher went to Brown University, you need a verb. <laughs> the only way you can write a sentence if, without one is if you know you're writing it without one and it's on in purpose, but you still need a verb. He didn't change he didn't it. Change. <laughs> he didn't change it. But at any rate. Do you draw inspiration primarily from people, from experiences, from settings, all of the above? Do I draw in inspiration from people? Yeah, not settings so much. Uh, well, if I, if I, yeah, I guess I could say yes. Um, I mean, I got really depressed in Jamaica when I was there, and I left early just because I just, you know, being inside of a resort is one thing, but when you go outside those gates, it's a whole different world. And it was too hypocritical because for me, I mean, it's a word I'm looking for, dichotomy. Um, it was such a contradiction. And I mean, I've been to Jamaica so many times, but this time was different. And it just broke my heart that there were certain places where it didn't feel like there was any progress that had been made. And I know what politicians do. And um, 
and it was insulting to me. So I, I try, as, just as a human being, it's just my nature to look at how people are behaving and what they feel versus, because a lot of people don't even express what they think. Mm -hmm. um, they just go through life reacting to things. And I pay attention to that. You know, and I have a, I have a, you know, some of my family members think, oh, Auntie Terry thinks she knows everything. No, I don't. I just question everything. And, you know, don't fault me for that. And if I ask you a question, you know, I'm not trying to indict you um, or put you on the witness stand. That's not it. But, you know, I think it was Socrates, I think, that said, you know, a life, um, an unexamined life is one that's not worth living. What, what do you do for fun? I'm a movie fan. I'm a, I have a, I love going to the movies, especially independent films. You know, not like to shoot them up, bang, bang things. I'm not big on espionage. Um, I watch murder on television. Investigation ID. I love those shows. Why, I don't know. Well, yeah, I do. Because they're, they're sort of like novels in a way. Um, because people do bad things and think they can get away with it. Sort of like some political parties. Mm -hmm. You know, and some people, they do things that they know are wrong. And they do it anyway. And they think they can get away with it. Sometimes they do, but I love it when they get caught. <laughs> <laughs> What's the be best piece of advice that you could offer to young people? To young people or young writers or both or what? Both. Young people and young writers. To young people, I would say stop trying to imitate everybody that you see. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that you have to do it. Be who you are. And give yourself permission to be curious about the world and the role you play in it. Um, but basically, don't try to imitate other people because you, you, you'll realize that that's not who you really even are. You're just imitating other people. And what was the other part? Young people and young writers. Young writers, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, write in your own voice. Um, don't try to be another writer. Um, don't try to imitate someone that you love, their work. Write from your gut. And when you do that, you don't, don't look over your own shoulder. Because if you do that, you're censoring yourself. And, and you will suffer. You will be editing yourself when you really should be freeing yourself up. Because that's what writing does. It liberates you. And sometimes it can also help you see and one of the reasons I do it is because I often do write about people I don't really either empathize with or understand. And so by choosing them, those kinds of characters deliberately, I force myself um, to jump outside of my own narrow-mindedness and put myself into someone else's shoes and inside of their skin. And as a result, I develop what I would like to think of as a lot more empathy for others and, and understand that a lot of things aren't as easy as we think they are. And that's what novels show you they can. And so that's what I would suggest to other writers. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Terry McMillan. You're welcome. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.